yes welcome back um anyone wants to raise any questions uh, regarding all the things that we talked about uh, up to john chapter 12 verse 36 if not we'll uh, move on into the last portion of john chapter 12 all right okay um yeah so the last portion of john chapter 12 is like a summation you know uh, it talks about the uh, what is the outcome of all that ministry which jesus had done over the three years uh, some people responded some people did not and it just basically you know summarizes their uh, response uh, so uh, if we could maybe read out verses 37 and 38 please john 12 37 and 38 Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord have been revealed? All right, so um, over here it's referring to Isaiah chapter 52 and Isaiah 53, uh, because Isaiah 52 is that chapter where it talks about, you know, um, uh, have lovely other feet of uh, you know what what was it? it was, um, yeah, Isaiah fifty two verse seven. Um, you know how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messengers who you know bring good news, and um, uh, it talks about the watchmen who are you know declaring what God is going to do. And um, after talking about all these wonderful things that God you know plans on performing. Um, Isaiah 52 verse 10 talks about how the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes. You know, and whenever, whenever it talks about the arm uh, in the Old Testament, it's talking about strength. So the Lord has, you know, uh, bared his strength. He has shown it to everyone. He has declared what he's going to do. And all of that is mentioned in Isaiah 52. And then coming to Isaiah 53 verse 1, it says, But Lord, you know, after all that has been declared and told, who believes us? You know, so that's uh, those are the words used over here. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, so uh, a lot of people reject what has been um, openly, you know, told to them. Uh, that is one response. The other response we see is in verses 42 and 43. Uh, so if someone could read out that. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believe in him, but for fear of the Pharisees they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. So uh, the other response is that there are people even in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the higher um, levels, the religious leaders who know their scriptures, and they see that what Jesus is saying is true. It does match up with whatever is mentioned in the Old Testament scriptures. And so many of those people also believe in him, but they do not come forward unlike Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you know, once he's sure that this is the Messiah, he's very plain and open about it. He's, he uh, openly, you know, brings out the fact that he is his follower. Uh, but these people, they don't want to reveal that they trust in him because for them, uh, their position is more important and the praise of um, their fellow people is more important to them than the praise of God. So we see these two responses over here. Um, uh, and uh, then, you know, now we are moving into the very last portions. Uh, so we come into John chapter 13, and um, it begins with the supper that Jesus has with his disciples. So um, John chapter 13, if we could have someone read out, you know, it's a very familiar passage. So we'll just look at some main things and then uh, move on from there. Um, John chapter 13, verses 3 to 5, if someone could read out, please. Ma'am, John chapter 13, 3 to 5. 
Jesus, knowing that, that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured out, poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Thank you. Yeah. So it says um, over here, um, supper being ended. Uh, in another version, it says, and during supper. So the wording, I mean, is a little unclear. Uh, but the I think what is being indicated over here is that now uh, all the arrangements for the supper have now been finished, completed. Okay, so it's all laid out. It's all ready on the table. And um, once everything is ready and the meal is going to begin, that is when Jesus gets up and he begins to uh, wash his disciples' feet. Uh, because it makes no sense if he were to do it halfway through the meal, uh, you know, when everyone is eating. Um, uh, so the impression that we get is that uh, preparations were going on, you know, the table was being laid out, um, you know, uh, all the arrangements were being put in place. And now it's all finished. It's all done. It's all ready. And once that is, uh, once the meal is just about to begin, that is when Jesus rises up uh, and he begins to wash their feet. Uh, so I'm assuming that Jesus waits because he's waiting for all the 12 to arrive. He doesn't want any of them to be left out. So he waits patiently until all of them have arrived and all the arrangements are now done. Everyone is now seated over there at the table and they're about to begin. And that is when Jesus gets up. And uh, how in with what attitude does he get up? He knows that all things are under his power. If he chooses to back out now, you know, at this point of time, if he just chooses to back out and not go through with the crucifixion, he has the power even to do that because uh, all things have been placed under his power. And he knows that he is from God. He is that he is divine, that he's going to go back and, you know, uh, reclaim his divinity once he goes back. He's aware of all that. Knowing all of that, he chooses to go ahead and do what he has been called to do. Okay, so being fully aware of his godhood, he gets up and he serves his um, disciples. And uh, for the disciples, this would have been a highly shocking thing uh, because um, in those days, even a teacher, a master did not have the right to ask his disciples, his followers to wash his feet. He could ask them to go bring food. He could ask them to go and arrange transport. Uh, he could ask them to you know, go to the next village and deliver a message. He could make many demands from them because they are his disciples. And he, he being their master deserves their respect. So um, the master could you know, make many demands, but one thing, that the master was not allowed to do is to ask uh, his disciples to wash his feet. I think it's mainly because the kind of uh, you know um, world that they were living in, uh, no paved roads, um, uh, things would have been uh, messy. Uh, all their transportation was not not cars and you know bikes, but uh, animals and you know dung, uh, donkey dung, cow dung, whatnot. Uh, so. They were not exactly walking through very pleasant roadways, pathways. And uh, so uh, their feet and their uh, you know, shoes, their sandals would have been in a rather messy condition. So even a, a disciple uh, was not supposed to be asked to do something like that. The master would have to do his own cleaning. You know, So here, uh, the master is not making a demand on his disciples. Rather, he is getting up and doing something for the disciples, which no master ever does. Uh, something which uh, you know, not even a disciple is expected to do, that the master is doing over here. And that is why this would have been highly shocking for them. So I'm not sure whether Jesus starts off with Peter or uh, Jesus you know, covers a few of the disciples and then comes to Peter. But when Peter's turn comes, he's just too shocked. He's not able to handle this whole idea. And uh, so we have verses um, 
six to eight happening. So if someone could read out verses six, seven, and eight, please. He came to Simon, Peter, and said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What am I doing here? Do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash yeah. your no, we'll get to that later. So uh, we'll just maybe look at verses six to eight now. Um, so over here, uh, Peter's response is, "Lord, are you washing my feet?" Now, if you look in the you know in Bible Hub and we look at the actual literal translation, uh, you have the words "you" and "me," you know, together placed next to each other. So, if you were to literally translate it, it's like as if you no, know, um, Peter is saying, "Lord, you, me," you know, or rather, mine. Lord, you, my feet. Washing, you know, it's like literally that, that would be the translation. So the huge contrast, the gap between you and me. Uh, you are divine. You are Lord. You are the Messiah who was promised. Me, you know, who am I? I'm just a disciple. I'm, I'm just a human. I'm nobody. So you, my feet washing, you know, is, is this shocking uh, thing. And so Peter, you know, uh, responds in that way. And... Uh, then Jesus makes this very important statement. Um, he says, uh, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And uh, then uh, he says, uh, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, I'm not sure whether Peter fully understood what was being said. Most probably not because he says, you know, you know, go ahead and wash the entire hands, legs, everything, because, you know, I want to be a part of you. So he didn't quite catch what Jesus was saying. But there's a very important point that Jesus is making over here. Uh, he says, if only if you allow me to wash you, then you can be a part of me. Um, so, you know, it is something that we need to uh, kind of grasp. Um, of course, it's talking about how he's going to clean our, you know, he's, he's of course talking about how he's going to cleanse us from our sins. And because of that, we know we are, because we are forgiven, uh, cleansed from our sins. Therefore, we can enter into God's family and be part of his family. That, of course, is there. Uh, but also, the point is, um, at the very core, you know, the, the core foundation of our relationship with God is not based on our serving him. Because I'm doing all these things for God, you know, I'm, uh, you know, do, uh, involved in the ministry, I'm helping the poor, I'm uh, uh, talking about him with people that I meet. Uh, it, there's this relationship that has been formed between Jesus and me is not based on all my serving and doing. Rather, this, the, this relationship has formed, this relationship has been initiated because Jesus chose to serve me. He chose to clean me. He chose to cleanse me. So at the core of the relationship, what exactly, how did this relationship get initiated? How did it come into existence? It's not out of the acts of service which you and I do. It's out of the act of service which he did for us which literally places us, in a, uh, places us in a very humble condition where we would literally go to him and say, yes, Lord, I admit that I am dirty and I need to be cleaned. And Lord, only you can do it. I'm too helpless to do this on my own. And we just go there and humble ourselves before him. And he chooses to serve us and clean us. And that is how that relationship is born. And then out of gratitude, out of loyalty, we choose to serve him. So it's uh, it should never be, you know, um, turned the other way around because uh, uh, the Pharisees were doing that. They were very proud about their service of God. You know, they were so happy that they were tithing in such a uh, detailed manner. And uh, they were very proud about all the uh, additional laws which they had added to the Sabbath, you know, and they were... They would not walk a certain number of feet because that may be considered work. And they were very happy about all these things that they were doing for God. And they thought that established some kind of relationship with him. But they were not willing to admit that they are blind, that they are dirty, that they need cleaning. No, uh, they are the ones who are doing something for God. And so they are great. But what, what did God expect? He wanted them to come in all humility and admit exactly how hopeless they are. 
they have no hope without him they have to admit that they are dirty and unclean and wait upon him for his free service and he out of his mercy and grace will grant them what they don't deserve you know he will just freely cleanse them and accept them so it's a very humbling thing uh, and uh, that is at the core of the relationship that we have with the Lord. And uh, so over here, um, in a sense, uh, Jesus is telling Peter, you know, uh, you need to humble yourself and accept what I am doing because you think that you're you know, sitting over there, you know, offering your love and loyalty to me, but you know, you're nothing. And if I don't act out of grace towards you, you can have no part of me at all. And uh, so, uh, Jesus serves us and does something for us which we could never ever do for ourselves. And because of his act of service, only because of that, we are in, in fact even in a relationship with him. So our gratitude should be so great uh, that he, being God, has done that for people like us. Okay, so uh, then um, Peter, of course, responds and he says, You know, oh, you, you know, go ahead and wash my head and my hands. Uh, uh, so if we could read out verses 9, 10, 11, please. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has been bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Okay, so over here, um, everything that Jesus is saying, he's saying it at two levels. Uh, on the one hand, you have the physical service that is going on where he's washing their feet. Their feet are in dirty state. He is uh, So he is you know, uh, humbling himself and doing that. But there's also something else happening at another level, the spiritual level, uh, where he's also indicating how he's going to cleanse them from their sins. So we should you know, continue to read this, uh, these verses in that sense. So uh, Peter's response is saying, oh Lord, if, yeah, if I can only be a part of you, if you are going to be doing this cleaning, then please go ahead and clean even my hands and my head. And then Jesus says, no, 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 anyone who's already taken a bath, uh, they're already clean. So it's just only the feet that need to be cleaned now and then. Um, but uh, they're already clean because they've already finished taking a bath. And then Jesus says, uh, but not all of you are clean, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So obviously over here is not referring to a physical bath. He's not trying to say that, okay, Peter, you have taken a bath, you're clean. On the other hand, Judas is sitting over here and is not taken a bath. Uh, so he is still unclean, not at all. Jesus is definitely not talking about that. Uh, he's saying that all these disciples sitting over there are already clean. But one person among them, he is not clean. So in how did this how did this bunch of people get clean? What happened? Uh, what led to a spiritual cleansing? Uh, we see that um, through some other verses. Uh, uh, some commentaries point out the similarity between this passage, which we are looking at right now, and John chapter 6, uh, verses 63 to 64. Okay, John chapter 6, 63 to 64, and this passage. Uh, are talking about the same thing. Uh, you could maybe say that they are a kind of parallel passages, you know. So um, if someone could read out for us John 6, 63 to 64, please. Okay. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are like. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would be who would betray him. Six so over five. here, um, Jesus is uh, talking about how the words which I am speaking to you, they are full of the spirit and life and you need to believe them. Uh, because if you believe them, then you can be a part of me. And uh, he says, yet there are some of you who do not believe. So there are someone in the among them is rejecting these words which are full of spirit and life. And Jesus, of course, was referring to the one who would uh, betray him. 
and then john 15 you know which we will be covering one in uh, the next class um or maybe the class after that so john 15 3 if someone could read out you're already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you okay so it says you are already clean because of the word i have spoken to you so the 11 disciples uh, heard these words which were full of the spirit and life and they chose to believe in them and by doing that they were cleaned okay so on the other hand one among them he refused to believe and so he remained unclean and uh, so uh, there are two levels of meaning being brought out over here even as jesus is cleaning the feet of his disciples um then we move on to verse 14 and then you know we'll connect the whole thing so uh if someone could read out for us verses 14 and 15 please if i then your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet for I have given you an example that you sh you also should do just as I have done to you. Okay, so uh, Jesus says, I have done this for you now, not just as an act of service, but also as an example. Just as, you know, um, I am laying down my life for you, you also would have to lay down your life. And in the same way, I am now serving you, you also must serve one another. So everything that Jesus is doing um, is an example to be followed. So here Jesus says, I have now set an example for you and you should do as I have done for you. And so again over here, it's talking in uh, what Jesus is saying is, you know, in two levels. At the physical level, you are expected to serve. You are expected to help one another. Um, but at the spiritual level, uh, you know, in the sense of uh, the spiritual cleaning that has happened, um, again, God calls upon his disciples to do that for one another, uh, uh, you know, to, to not clean one another, but in the sense of, you know, uh, building one another up, uh, you know, helping uh, each other to remain in the Lord in that sense. Um, for instance, let's just look at two verses and, you know, that would make it more clear. Uh, Exod um, okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. If we could have someone read out Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Is someone reading out? Because I am unable to hear, but I can see that blue outline so i think you are reading brother with all lowliness and gentleness with long suffering bearing with one another in love yes um yeah uh El elisha I, I could not hear you i'm so sorry your voice did not come through um yeah um Ephesians 4.2, it says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Okay, so over here, that word that is being used for bearing, that would be the Greek word aneko. Okay, and uh, aneko, the word bearing, doesn't just mean simply being patient with someone. It also means holding up someone, you know, you're bearing them, you're holding them up in that sense. Uh, so it's used in two senses. Um, so uh, when you come across a brother or sister uh, who is um, with whom you are not compatible, you're unable to kind of, you know, gel with them and you are finding them very irritating and difficult to be with. Um, you would have to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with them in love. 
Now, I always thought of this phrase, bearing with you know them in love, meant I would have to grit my teeth and say, OK, fine, this person is a sister in the Lord, and so I have to put up with her. And then I just grit my teeth and will myself and say, OK, fine, I'm just going to bear it and not going to say anything. I'll just bear it. But no, it's not at all talking about that horrible negative way of bearing. It's talking about how you reach out in love and you try to help them. You know, whatever it is that's actually troubling them and making them be that particular way, you try to lift them out of that. You try to aneko, you try to you know, bear them, you know, to lift them up and, uh, you know, uh, to make things better for them. So there's such a great difference, right? The negative attitude of just gritting your teeth and saying, oh, what a nuisance, but I have to put up with them. And the very positive way of, you know, way you are building the other person up by saying, okay, what can I do to try and cheer this person up and help them so that, you know, they are uh, not so miserable and bitter and angry and all of that. So uh, there's a huge difference. Now, all of this also would be acts of service, you know, um, and uh, we'll just look at another verse and then, you know, we'll kind of wrap up this whole concept. Uh, James 5.16, if someone could read out, please. James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Thank you. Yes. Uh, here it says, confess your sins to each other. Does that mean that, you know, uh, I go and confess to another sister and then she says, I forgive you in Jesus' name? Uh, I mean, does it mean it in, I mean in that sense? Or over here, you know, is it saying that, you open up to uh, someone that you trust and you know uh, share your weaknesses with them and then you admit to them very openly where you have fallen and then you know uh, you pray for each other to grow stronger so in that sense you are cleaning each other you are helping reach uh, each other to again you know grow strong in god and to renew your commitment so all of these also would be acts of service towards one another so the ceremony that we have you know where people give us gloves and they give us tissues and they give us one nice clean bowl of water and they say go ahead and do the feet washing ceremony doesn't take any effort at all in fact now now nowadays it's like very highly hygienically done so in fact i don't know whether it has any value at all but uh Jesus said, I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done. And so he is talking about how at the physical level, you literally go out of your way to help and to serve uh, in, um, you know, not just in posh ways, but in ways where you would actually have to put in effort, uh, where you would have to make a sacrifice to actually help that other person. So uh, he's talking about that kind of uh, service which costs you which, you know, uh, and not it's not talking about just a ceremonial feet washing, which takes no effort at all. Um, and he's also talking about a, at a spiritual level where you are caring for each other, trying to lift one another up, strengthen one another in the Lord so that, you know, both of you can together um, go forward and, uh, you know, be what God wants you to be. So um, he's talking about people who confess to each other openly and admit their faults and pray for each other so that they can you know grow once again in God. Uh, so these would be uh, the kind of feet washing that uh, Jesus would really admire and appreciate. Okay, so um, throughout this passage, we see that there's a physical level of service uh, where you actually bend down, put in the effort, make the sacrifice, humble yourself and serve. And there's also the other spiritual level where you are strengthening someone, building them up, uh, you know, um, uh, being patient with them so that they also can be brought up to the level where you are in the Lord. So uh, you have both of these levels of service being talked about over here. All right. Um, uh, yeah, uh, this one person here was written in the chat that they are unable to open their assignment. Um, as far as I know, most of the students have been able to access their assignments. Um, 
sometimes if you have not finished the you know um, the portions earlier portions uh, where you have not watched the previous videos completely then uh, the next uh, portion does not open up so um, if you have already opened up all the previous portions and completed them and now you have come to the assignment um, and if it is still not opening then uh, maybe you could contact the technical team um, or you know just simply put it in the in the in the discussion group you know generally where you write your um, um, that would be what the stream page right yeah maybe you could put it in the stream page or uh, I was told that uh, people can directly contact the technical team because there's some email that they can send them uh, so they can take care of that for you uh, but generally the uh, I'm not sure I mean I'll uh, try to find out I can maybe tell the technical team that you are unable to open um, I don't know I'm kind of new to all of this uh, so I'm not too sure about the technical side but I can inform them uh, that um, uh, yeah, uh, Simran. Simran is unable to open, and uh, if they can help in any way, and if possible from your side also, if you could just send an uh, you know email to the technical team, following whatever instructions they have given. I think they've given some email ID uh, that will help them to you know directly talk to you and contact you. All right, um, yeah, uh, we'll move into. Uh, oh yeah, verse seventeen. Maybe we should look at verse seventeen before we move on to the next passage um, verse 17 Jesus says now that you know these things you will be blessed if you do them so just simply knowing about these things is not enough um, we don't get blessed through our knowledge we get blessed by acting on our knowledge by putting it into practice okay so um, that is a, a very important point which Jesus makes over here um, so we will now move into the next portion. Um, maybe we can look at verses 18 to 21. Uh, when I'm doing these classes and I'm teaching, I, you know, I, I used to teach earlier at a at a college uh, online. I was teaching online, and uh, everyone used to keep their cameras on, and I could see whether they are in the class uh, listening or not. Uh, this is a very different setup for me, uh, where I have absolutely no clue whether anyone is even listening or not. Uh, so all I can do is hope that you are there, that you are present, and that you're watching and listening. Uh, especially sometimes when nobody even responds for the Bible reading, I really want, oh, no, no, you don't need to like switch on your cameras. But I, I just kind of wonder sometimes, is anybody there at the other end, or am I just speaking to myself? You know, so yeah thank you so much uh, and yeah you don't need to keep it on because you know it uh, it affects the what the internet speed so i totally understand that but it's just like an assurance to know when someone actually reads the bible passage i know that oh, okay at least they are present at least they are listening so it helps a lot uh, yeah um oh yeah thanks asha <laughs> yeah you're listening uh, yes all right, so now we are in John chapter 13, and if someone could read out verses 18 to 21. Yes. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know that I have chosen, but that the spirit, sorry, but, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come, does it when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am He. Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes who whoever who, who, whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you. One of you will betray me. Yeah. So uh, here Jesus says, uh, um, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly, I tell you, um, one of you is going to betray me. So Jesus is troubled in spirit. Um, he is very uh, concerned about 
what is going to take place next. Uh, and so the disciples may think later, oh, Jesus was not aware of what's going to happen. He was not aware that Judas was uh, working against him. So they should not think that. Uh, so they would, uh, Jesus wants to assure them that he is all knowing. Um, you know, these things have been revealed to him by the Father. So he says, even before it has happened, I'm already telling you so that you can believe me, uh, believe that I am who I am that I have been sent by God and I am aware of these things and everything is moving according to schedule. OK, so um, a lot of people raise this question. They say, why after knowing uh, Judah's heart from the beginning, after knowing from the beginning what kind of a person he is, why? Why did Jesus choose him at all? Um, I do have no, I have no answer to that. Um, one uh, thing could be that, uh, you know, Jesus was giving him one more chance uh, you know, in spite of knowing his heart, in spite of knowing that here is a man who has no repentance, uh, who has uh, no love for the things of God, in spite of knowing that maybe God was giving him a chance um, so that, you know, one day, you know, Judas would have to admit and say, yes, I was given full opportunity, uh, you know, to change, to, to have a different attitude. So God gave him a second chance. On the other hand, maybe, um, um, Jesus was just willing to show his love towards Judas by allowing him to be part of the inner circle and experience uh, things which you know the rest of the uh, people did not. So he was given that privilege um, just out of love. So it could be that. And um, some people say, you know, Jesus needed a traitor so that you know the crucifixion will happen and so he just went around and uh, you know he looked for a traitor and he saw a person with a traitorous heart and he thought okay fine this guy will do and so he chose him i don't think um, that the lord would you know um go about things in that kind of with that kind of an attitude uh, so he is a god of compassion of love uh, so i at least would like to believe that he wanted to give him a second chance, that he wanted to show that he is a God who even loves those who reject him. OK, so they are given every opportunity to change their ways. And if they still choose not to, then you know that is, it's upon them. The judgment is upon them. Um, Yes, <laughs> thank you so much for the responses. And I was just like, kind of puzzled uh, because I mean, not many were responding to the Bible uh, passage readings. So I was kind of wondering why. And yeah, thank you for all the uh, chat messages. Um, OK, so we come to verses 22 uh, to 20, 22 to 30. It's a rather large chunk. So we will not read all of those verses. Uh, but let's just touch upon one or two verses. Verse 22, where it says, uh, the disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. And then you have uh, Peter asking uh, John and saying, you know, find out who it is. And uh, so in verse 25, um, you have John asking Jesus, Lord, who is it? And in verse 26, Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Um, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Um, so even as we read this wording, the wording just sounds so similar to the, you know, um, Holy Communion passages, which we generally read, and in fact, uh, you know, this is a representation. I mean, this is this is you know the the Holy Communion passages which we read from Corinthians. They are basically based on this particular event, right? Um, if we, which is the passage which actually talks about that. Matthew 26, Matthew 26, 21 to 28. You know, again, we're not going to read that entire passage. But if you just quickly go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, 21 to 28, over there, uh, very clearly the whole, you know, Holy Communion wording is used. Um, Matthew 26, verse 26. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, 
take and eat this is my body so you know we understand the significance of what jesus is doing over here for judas he takes the bread he dips it in the broth and he gives it to him and says you know take it so even here in this last moment you know um jesus is still reaching out to judas and saying you know here partake in my body be a part of my flock be one of my you know sheep but um this is a sheep which does not want to hear his voice and so in this last minute when jesus is still reaching out to him and you know and hands him over the bread it's like literally he is saying you know participate in my body you know be part of my flock uh, and then what what happens when judas takes the bread um it says um in verse 27 back in our john chapter 13 john chapter 13 verse 27 one last invitation that is being given to him he has already finished making up his mind and so the bread which is supposed to bring you literally into a relationship with the lord rather drives him into a relationship with satan it's such a shocking and terrible thing uh yeah this um uh yeah the questions about his repentance um uh the conspiracy regarding whether one of the the uh, the luke person uh, having uh, washed his feet was she a concubine uh, well uh, we are aware that you know jesus did not have any concubines at all uh, it's um, it's only the uh, you know the stories which were written about him almost uh, 200 years later which come up with all of these theories uh, so um, you know about him having gone to uh, to china not not to china to japan that he went to japan and he got married over there and all of these so all of these stories began to uh, be written uh, in in those you know ancient works which were written about 200 ad um, long after jesus death so what would we say is the historical accuracy of all of those writings they you know in the early church time when the first writings were written no such stories were written during that entire era by anyone and a lot of hostile accounts were written about the christians right at that time about how these are troublemakers and their um, master claims to have risen from the dead they could have easily put in another line saying that here is this man who had a lot of concubines but nobody ever wrote such things these were all stories which were written almost 200 years later and uh, so they have almost no historical backing at all so we would not even go uh, you know with such stories um just to just quickly touch upon that uh, but then the other question was uh what about judas you know did he really repent um now <laughs> i do not know because he does feel sorry for what he has done and he admits that what he did was wrong so he admits he did wrong and he is sorry for what he has done uh, but he instead of you know uh, coming back to the disciples and uh, you know asking what to do next or even going just to god and falling down on his knees and crying out for mercy like the tax collector you know who comes to the temple and he says lord uh, i'm so unclean you know i am i'm a sinner have mercy upon me he doesn't do any of that he just goes ahead and um, kills himself so uh, did he you know um, get into a relationship with god no he felt sorry for what he had done he admitted that what he had done is wrong but he did not go back and re-enter into a relationship with god he didn't um, he kills himself which is a tragedy he could have actually you know gone back and um, the lord would have forgiven but then he he had crossed a point where he could think logically because now satan had taken over his mind and satan definitely was not going to allow this particular you know person to escape so he probably would have confounded his mind and controlled it to such an extent that this man would not even have considered the thought of returning so he just kills himself so no he never 
re-entered into a relationship with God. Uh, he, of course, he never had a personal relationship with Jesus, but he could have gone back to him and, you know, reached out to God. But he does not do that. We don't see that written anywhere. So, uh, yeah, now we have people raising their hands. Ouch! No, do we? If we get into the whole Judas thing, then we will not be able to finish our portion. Okay, what else can we dwell upon that's really important? Wait, just give me a minute and I'll just think about it. Um, fine, okay, yeah, all right. Maybe we can, you know, um, we can deal with the rest of the chapter in our next session. So, yes, let, we can handle a few questions. Um, yes, we had uh, two persons actually raising their hand. Uh, yeah, right now we have uh, uh, Brother Albuquerque, his name is on the screen. So, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. No. Oh, we don't have questions, is it? I, oh, sorry, I thought I was on mute. Uh, no, my question is actually about the bread that was dipped, uh, um, uh, you know, um, by, you know, by Jesus, and he gave it to Judas Iscariot. I'm just trying to understand. Um, this is come from from Jesus. So uh, how how is it that you know um, that piece of after eating this piece of bread, Satan entered uh, into into uh, Judas Iscariot. Um, you know, I'm just trying to understand that. If you could explain that, please. Oh. I mean, I, my personal understanding is that he actually dips the bread and gives it to him. It's like one last opportunity where he is, uh, you know, Jesus is saying, even now, if you wish to, you can take, you know, and uh, in Ma the Matthew wording, it would be take and eat. This is my body. So he even now in this last minute, uh, he is being given an opportunity to come and join the flock if he wishes to. So the minute he refuses to do that, that's it. Now he's now you know, open meat for Satan. I mean, now uh, uh, Judas has made his choice. And so now he completely comes under Satan's control. Satan's control to such an extent that there is no chance of any repentance anymore because now he's no longer able to exercise his free will anymore. You know, it's like now completely under Satan. And he, uh, Satan literally drives him to suicide at the end of it. Uh, so he's completely lost. Uh, but I believe that even in this last minute, he he was again being given one final chance if he wished to to accept. So he eats the bread. We have a lot of people coming on Sundays and sitting at the you know communion, and um, they eat the wafer, they drink the grape juice. But in their heart, have they eaten it? In their heart, have they truly you know participated in that? Uh, in that you know, grape juice and in the blood which it represents, are they really in a covenant with him? Because finally, it comes down to that, right? Um, the the bread and the uh, grape juice are representing the covenant that Jesus has formed with us. We do this in remembrance of what he did on the cross in establishing his covenant with us. So um, if a person has really not entered into a covenant relationship, then what they are doing by eating and drinking uh, that juice is just a outward ritual and it has no spiritual implications on the other hand if a person who has genuinely entered into a covenant relationship is remembering that covenant even as they are partaking there's such power in that because they are remembering what god has achieved on the cross for them and they're saying wow, this is going to happen in my life. Believing that and reminding myself of that, now I am eating this wafer. Reminding myself of what Jesus did for me and the victory, you know, the, the, the enemy has been disarmed and uh, the enemy has been made a public spectacle of and now uh, this he has no hold over me because now I'm in the covenant and Jesus, you know, is going to fulfill all of those things which I need for my life. So you're, you're remembering all that he has done and you're taking it. Then the eating and the drinking has significance. Judas, who had been putting on an outward ceremony throughout, makes his final act of outward ceremony where he eats the bread. 
but it's just bread that he's eating because it's not backed up by any cleaning that has happened in his heart. When the words which were full of life and spirit were spoken to him, he rejected them. He chose not to believe them. So he never became clean. So when he took that bread and ate it, all he was doing is just eating bread. Uh, it was not backed up by a previous cleaning and commitment and belief. Yeah, I think that would be it. Um, yeah, anyone else? Uh, no, there are no other questions. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I thought you were. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, in the question seven, uh, after giving uh, uh, Judas the bread, you just told him what you're supposed to do, go and do it quickly, uh, go quickly and do it. So one thing we understand that uh, if Jesus didn't give up his life, no one had the power to kill him, not even Satan or not even uh, those, uh, the high priest and, 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 and his army. So what the, what the relationship is there between Jesus allowing uh, Jesus, so giving him bread and allowing such Satan to come into his life, and him, Jesus, giving up his life so that the, the word uh, can be fulfilled and the world can be saved. Because there must be a relationship. Jesus did not, doesn't have power to betray Jesus. And high priest cannot kill Jesus without Jesus giving himself up. Death cannot take Jesus' life without him. Surrendering himself to. So, what's the relationship now? Can we consult, uh, bring everything together? I'm not sure I caught all of that. <laughs> um, uh, okay. it, the, it, it, sound is not very clear. Uh, and, you know, if you could maybe put it more concisely, you know, just in one or two sentences. Yes. Uh, Okay. Yes. Um, go ahead. Yeah. In verse 27, it says that after Jesus dipped the bread, mm. gave it to Judas, and when the set, when Satan came in, he told mm. Judas, "Go quickly uh, mm. to do what he's supposed to do." You're right, huh? So Judas could not didn't have the power to betray Jesus if Jesus didn't give him permission. And the high priest could not kill Jesus if Jesus did not allow them to kill him. Not the death has power over Jesus because he was God and he was perfect. So can you, yeah can from you um so uh, yeah uh, from the very beginning right from Adam and Eve God has always given people the permission to make a free choice. So um, just like Adam and Eve were given a free choice, the Pharaoh was given a free choice. Um, a lot of people down the ages were given free choice uh, to decide whether uh, they want to live in accordance with God's word or to betray him and go against him. So in the same way over here, um, Judas was being completely wants to do and when he made his choice then satan came uh, and uh, you know entered into him so he literally became not just demon possessed he became satan possessed and um, once he or satan possessed or demon possessed yeah it's true to an extent you don't really have complete free, free will anymore because you're completely controlled by that demon or that or satan or whatever so um, he would have lost his free will to an extent but he made that free choice to allow himself to be possessed you know so um, um god from his side gives all humans the freedom to make their choices freely whether they want to stand with him so the 11 disciples chose to stand with him judas chose not to stand with him when judas judas chose not to stand with him he allowed himself to come under the power of satan and satan took possession of him took full control of him 
And yeah, in fact, he would have lost his free will at that point of time because now he has yielded himself to Satan. And you know, um, uh, yeah, so maybe something of that sort. Um, all right, so um, yeah, we'll um, you know just close with a word of prayer. I think that's um, yeah, not receiving the washing of the word. Yeah, so true, because uh, every time you refuse to be washed by the word, you are hardening your heart a little more. And the more you harden your heart, the less you will be able to hear the warning from the Holy Spirit. And uh, you could get yourself into a lot of trouble when you stop listening to the warnings. Uh, so yes, when you refuse the word, you tend to harden your heart. And hardening of the heart can be a dangerous thing, because you, you lose the sensitivity. And you don't realize you're getting into danger. And uh, it can harm us. So yeah, let's just close very quickly with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for the various things that we could touch upon in today's class. Um, thank you, O oh Lord, for the lessons that we can learn from the life of Mary, uh, who was so faithful, and the words of warning that we can learn from the life of Judas, uh, who in spite of having experienced your love in such a real personal way chose to reject you so i pray oh lord that we would um, be like mary a person full of gratitude and loyalty and who was willing to give her very best uh, because she was so grateful for what you had done for her and we pray oh lord that we would be like that rather than Judas was completely ungrateful, O Lord, for the privilege that he had been given to be part of the 12, uh, to be able to perform signs and wonders along with the other 12, to be able to be uh, a part of everything that Jesus was personally sharing with his inner, inner core circle. And even after enjoying all of that, there was no gratitude, O Lord. And I pray that we would not be like that. We would be sensitive to your word, which is full of the spirit and life, and we would respond to it, and we would live according to it. Help us a lot to be like that. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so sorry. I've taken up your time. Uh, we'll finish immediately. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you.